As soon as the war started, food was short, and the war agricultural executive could take over any unused land and get it ploughed up. All around Chesham, where I live, were derelict overgrown building sites, which were handed over to me and other farmers to work. I farmed 200 acres at the beginning of the war and 450 by the end. The biggest single practical change in my farming life and in everybody else's that I know of was brought about by lease lend from America during the war, whereby over a very short space of time we got much more advanced and more sophisticated machinery than we'd ever had before and were able to do our work much better. I myself, in a very short space of time, had a crawler tractor, diesel crawler tractor, a combine harvester, a baler, a British-made dryer to go with that, and also an American wheel tractor. The whole thing giving a much better output and enables us doing far more work than we'd ever done before. The very first combine to come to Chilton's area came to the other side of Chesham to a man called Hugh Sampson. I heard about it. I heard about his drying and everything, and I took Will Barnett over to see it. And all the way over to see it, he was saying, oh, they'll never come in this country. When he saw it, within minutes, because he knew the work properly, he said, we've got to have one of those buggers. And so the very next year, we got one. Although the combine was a completely revolutionary machine, Will Barnett understood it when it came to us on Grove Farm. It arrived in a packing case with instructions, which were irrelevant, because Will couldn't read. But all the jobs it did, he had done with other machines all his life. So it was just a problem of putting it together. The cutter bar from the mower, conveyors from the binder, and the drum from the thrashing machine. All the tiresome work of shocking, carting, stacking, and thatching, done away with at a stroke. Combines couldn't come in quickly enough to do the whole harvest, so use had to be made of all the old machines. John Barton's firm had a lot of experience in this field. Thousands and thousands of acres were ploughed up, and so that equipment that had been discarded from the First World War was suddenly in demand. A lot of it had been standing out in stinging nettles and on, uh, in areas, you know, discarded, but uh, my father and I and a few more characters got these things together, repaired them, and got them going in double quick time. He knew where most of the derelict machines were, one of which was in uh, Welpley Hill at uh, Bill Stambridge's place. He'd been using it as a, as a hen coop. And when we turned up and he uh, agreed to uh, let us have it, provided we paid enough for it to enable him to buy a hen coop. The old machines left lying around since the First World War, when food was last short, had to do, until the new equipment arrived, doubling output and productivity. I think probably you and certainly I talked a lot of rubbish about combines. We said because our fields were small and our climate was wet, We'd never be able to use combines. I, I'm quite embarrassed when I feel what I talked about. And we were young men. What the old men were thinking, Lord knows. <laughs> and we were, we were wrong, of course, because combine has proved absolutely adaptable uh, to our system. As a byproduct of an increasing mechanization during the war, we became more conscious of the fact that the machines were not working anywhere near to 100% efficiency because the fields were so small. There was the arrival of the bigger machines that made us realize that the fields were, if you like, designed for men and horses, and now suddenly we've got uh, quite big machines. So we had an incentive to enlarge the fields, and uh, before the end of the war, I was taking out quite a few hedges and being encouraged to do so by everybody, being cheered on by the local population who wanted more food, and I, in fact, ran a demonstration for the... The Ministry of Agriculture of hedge removal with hard bulldozers and enlarged weather reds from the six acres it had previously been to 26 acres. And my immediate neighbours have been taking out hedges now and the general population is hostile to it. People are hostile to changes in the landscape when they've got full bellies and they're friendly towards them when they're short of food and know that you'll be growing food on the land where the hedges were. This is our biggest field, 60 acres. It was abandoned as poor land before the war, brought back into cultivation at a rent of 10 shillings an acre, and is now carrying one of our best crops. Science, by correcting deficiencies, has made poor land good. Dungrove Farm is a mile and a half from Grove Farm, 
and is where my son Dan lives. He was born during the war and came into this post-war farming scene with a lot of changes underway and many more to come. Now, after 25 years, he's managing both our farms and lives here with his wife and children. What are you going to do with them, Mum? Are you going to make jam? No, I'm going to freeze them. The land I started with was 200 acres all in one spot. But expansion has led to the land Dan deals with being scattered. Yeah. It used to be said that the farmer's feet were the best fertiliser. And if you had 100 acres all in one spot, you could walk your farm in very quick time and you could see what was happening. And you have to know what's happening. You can't leave your crops alone. If I go away, which is unusual, for a week, if I come back at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, before I do anything, I will go and see what's happened. See whether there are slugs eating the emerging corn, or whether the wild oats have come, or the black grass has come, or there are aphids on the corn, depending upon the time of year. So you could say that the Land Rover is my feet, because we're spread over an area, if you take the whole lot in together, the area, encompassed by a line drawn around the outermost limits would be probably oh, seven or eight square miles. It's not a very big farm, but it's still a long way to go, and on Shanks's pony, I'd wear my legs out like my dad. Farming is still all about looking and observation. Dan can see things that I would never see, and I wouldn't know what they were if I saw them. This crop of wheat, which looks perfectly healthy to me, may be about to suffer an attack. If Dan can diagnose trouble early and treat it, we're all right. In the past, the loss of an entire crop was not uncommon. It's happened to me. A major part of today's huge production is the avoidance of pests, which makes things a bit more predictable. That's the difference between our generations. Dan is absolutely different type of farmer to me. He started differently because he was a farmer's son. I wasn't a farmer's son. He also is by nature a mechanical man. I'm not. I'm hopeless with machinery. I'm a livestock man in my heart. And he is a trained botanist. I was trained for practically nothing. So there are big differences. He is no doubt much more suitable for going into a technological age of farming. Farmers pat themselves on the back all the time about how clever they are, how much they've, more they've produced any year than the, more than the previous year. But in fact, we're not better than our forebears. We've just got a vastly improved number of weapons. We have the chemists working for us, producing fungicides, insecticides, um, uh, treatments for the seeds and treatments for the animals. We have um, new varieties of corn, new varieties of maize that we can now grow in this country for, not for cereals yet, but that'll come for forage. We don't work better than our forebears. We don't even work longer than our forebears. And we certainly don't work harder than they did because most of our life is spent pulling levers. In the whole year, I don't think I lift more than five or six tonnes of anything. But I might do a bit more of it. Basically speaking, our work is done for us. Instead of dragging elderberry bushes along the field to try and kill the flea beetle, we can use a variety of chemicals. So we've got all these weapons, all these things to help us. The chemists are so sophisticated that they can produce chemicals now, and they have produced chemicals now. One of them is aptly named Finesse. It's, it is, it's very, uh, very accurate. I think we use a quantity of about one and a half ounces per acre. It kills a large proportion of the broadleaf weeds in winter corn without affecting the crop at all. And many of the chemicals we're using pounds or less per acre, 4,840 square yards. Bill King is a tractor driver with a lifetime's experience and he does most of the arable work on the farm. Bill gets to work at quarter past seven most mornings and then we discuss what we're going to do for the day because he's the key man on the place now. Nothing works without Bill.
this time of year I'm drilling it's perhaps seven o'clock starts and nine half nine finish and I might see Dan once in the day if he's busy he just comes and checks me out once and I'm always on my own don't see anybody you know all day so it's just sort of someone come a footpath with a dog this field we're in now I will sow it put the fertilizer on spray it do all the jobs to it and you can see through the months of the year everything changes and it's and you've done everything to make that field change. It's you that's altering the landscape. Over the years, the labor on Grove Farm has declined dramatically. From nine men in the early 70s to six when Bill first started, and now there are just two men, a boy and Dan, producing more than ever. Which way is it going now? It's gone that way, so. Be pulled. Well, yeah. go and work it. Sorry. Why that one? The financial pressures to do jobs more cheaply all the time means that we have bigger and bigger machines with less and less men. The bigger the machine you have, the more acres it can cover. And there's a sort of irresistible pressure to get the larger machine and then to get enough acreage to, to satisfy its appetite. The farm's 800 acres, which for this area is, I would say, about average or a little larger. Mm. I don't know whether it's big enough to survive on in the future. So we're grain specialists. We've given up a lot of things which others are specialising in. My neighbour Ben Bowden, the son of a general farmer, now does pigs alone. He's a cousin of John Bowden, the thrashing contractor who resurrected the old machines in wartime. Ben began on a small scale with about 30 sows and he's built up to two and a half thousand pigs. 30 years ago, pigs were much fatter than they are today, perhaps almost twice as fat. And by careful selection, we've managed to get them so much leaner and at the same time, they're much more efficient in the way they turn food into lean meat and they grow faster. In fact, if we go back 30, if we went back to the pigs of 30 years ago, we would probably lose 10 or 15 pounds on every pig we produced. Pig keeping lends itself to mechanization. One push of an electric button feeds this whole pen. Anybody who doesn't modernize falls by the wayside. Technology in farming changes so fast that if if I was operating today with the technology of 15 years ago, I should be absolutely out of date. The changes of genetics, nutrition, pig housing, management, have been through a revolution in that time, and that revolution, of course, will continue. In the 1950s, all forms of farming in Britain that had advanced enormously under the influence of science and economics and everything else. Uh, uh, the crops were yielding much better, the milk cows were yielding much better. One thing hadn't advanced at all, and that's the beef cattle. If anything, they were inferior to the beef cattle that had been 150 year years before. And that really is because uh, public tastes had changed and the beef breeds had originally been bred by people who wanted fat, and now they no longer wanted fat. And it would have taken 50 years to change our native breeds. So lots of people were looking around the world for some country which already had beef animals suitable for modern tastes. And with some friends, we hit on France and the Charlet breed, so we set out to bring them in and establish a new breed here. We were told, all right, you bring them in, but these are the conditions. You must find a quarantine where you can unload straight from the sea into the quarantine, not across any agricultural land. You must uh, arrange for the quarantine to be anything up to three months in this country, following a quarantine of a month in France. And then if anything fails, any diseases to test at the end of that quarantine, the whole lot will be sent back to France. So it's pretty stringent. And we got over it uh, by courtesy of the commander in chief Plymouth Naval Dockyard, not commercial dockyard. We borrowed a building from him where you could unload cattle from the sea under naval security. <laughs> Nobody could query it. 
In a very short space of 25 years, they've become the second most numerous and by far the most important beef breed in the country. In only 25 years. We've kept our Charolais on this farm pure and pedigree because our trade with them is for bulls on crossing on other herds, and so people want to have the guaranteed origin of a pedigree. And of course, the influence of a bull is tremendous in the herd. It always used to be said, the bull is half the herd. And in fact, that's true, because he's half of every calf that comes in the herd. And so you use a bull of another breed, like the Charolais on an English breed, immediately half your herd becomes half Charolais. There's only one full-time man with the livestock now on Grove Farm, George Lyon. The son of a farmer, all his life has been spent with cattle, before us with a milking herd. With about 70 breeding cows and 110 young stock, a lot of his job is handling the animals. Well, I am the stockman on, the, on this farm, and I've been with animals all my life, and really to work with animals, I think you've got to like them very much because especially when you're milking because you know it's seven days a week twice a twice a day you're milking so you've really got to love your cows to be able to stick it and the use of uh, of charlie balls from this farm has really been all over the world on one occasion when we had a bull which was qualified to sell semen to australia and the australians are terribly fussy lengthy tests spannery tests the rest of it and I finished up with 6,000 doses of semen from this particular bull, which was usable in Australia. So I took it out there and sold it and got a good trip all around Australia and New Zealand out of it, plus a profit as well for me and the man who shared the bull with me. In the early days, every bull calf was sold for reproduction. New Zealand, Australia and America all wanted Charolais from us. And perhaps our biggest trade was with Texas. The men who came across to buy from us were cowboys. Some of them were oil men as well. They came across dressed as you would expect them to dress and spitting on the carpet quite regularly. And uh, uh, were very keen buyers for our first bull calves. And it was a bit of bonus for us and a bit extra reward for having brought the breed in. Now, some of our cattle go just for beef and only the best for breeding. The biggest market in Europe is Banbury. It's a good place to sell Charolais, with vendors from all over Britain and buyers from all over Europe. Although many of the buyers are from the big retail groups, they're still using the same skills small butchers used years ago, judging the weight of actual meat and the quality of an animal under the skin. We're selling here at the rate of somewhere between 150 and 160 animals an hour. So that gives you seconds per beast, you see. So you've only the chance while it turns round to make it the decision and buy it because then it's out and gone. Slim Taylor has been coming here for 30 years as a buyer. When I first came, we used to need a finish, yeah. you know, which is going back 30 odd years, yeah. which is fat, really. Yeah. We're, in other words, everybody liked fat yeah. in those days. And, and gradually, with the health consciousness of the public and, and, uh, and taste effort, the younger generation of people don't like fat at all. So you then have to come gradually, the beast that you use gradually comes leaner and leaner. And um, obviously the leaner beast then makes the most money, you know. And when I first came, a, a good sick beast was the one that made the money. But nowadays it's the leanest and best shaped beast that makes the money. And this very morning I've had a, some justification for keeping Charolais as a breed because my barren cows in ring number one are made considerably more than the general run of cows, because they're Charolais and apparently were considered to have a lot of lean meat. They in fact got the best price that I saw by quite a considerable margin. Jack, two. 
My animals went back to be eaten in France, where their grandmothers had come from. Others went to Germany and Belgium. And from here, sheep go all over Europe. The whole of our farming now is international. EEC has seen to that. Up to now, we've had a, a wonderful honeymoon. And I don't think the EEC as politicians are any worse to deal with than if we were outside. It's a, a, a current groan of the farmers that they have to deal with the EEC. But without any question at all, they all voted to go in, just as I did. But I don't think they're any worse than anybody else. They're bureaucrats and politicians. They run our lives. They have done since the war, and they will do to what I die. After the war, we just could not produce enough food. And government made legislation to encourage food production as fast as they could. This was embodied in the 1947 and 1957 Acts. And agricultural production and efficiency of production improved tremendously all through those post-war years up to the time we joined the common market in 1974 and when we joined the common market nobody believed that the members of the common market would ever be self-sufficient in temperate foods 11 years later not only are they self-sufficient but we've got surpluses of virtually everything we produce they're not so bad they like the weather the politicians they're unpredictable you cannot plan your lives about the wishes of the politicians all you can say is perhaps it's because we get stoical about it uh, we plan our week we plan our month we plan our year the weather intervenes the politicians intervene they're just as unpredictable and let's hope we don't get hurricane gloria in a political sense the market the EEC dictates what we grow and it wants rape now, a quarter of the arable on Grove Farm may be in rape. We've reintroduced peas. I remember harvesting this field with another man in the 30s, and it took us a week. Now we do this lot in a day with the combine. Barley is a traditional crop in this area. It's in surplus, but quality grain is saleable, and this will go to Scotland for whiskey. And some is used on the farm for the cattle. The wheat is all grown for sale. With us, it's more than everything else put together. 80% of what we produce. There are many varieties. Some go for breakfast sales, some for bread, and some for animal feed. Some is withdrawn from the market and bought into EEC stores. That's where this lot is going. Grain trade has changed. 50 years ago, the assessment of quality was done the way it had been done for centuries. Ralph Seymour used to come and buy from me when I first started and he came to look at what we're doing now. We've got about 350 tons here, I think, uh -huh. for a variety of wheat rapier. Mm. Which I think is a good feeding variety. You see, what do you think about it? Mm, well, it's all right for feeding, Tony, but... When I pick a handful up, I was thinking, I get the weight, then I smell, because there are various diseases which can be in wheat, such as thinking smut and so on. Then I look to assess the screenings, then I'd put it in my mouth, some of it, not only to taste it, but to also help towards the softness of the wheat. And then I chew it, which gives me an idea of the possible gluten. You've seen, Michael, when you've seen it, we've got to do a deal. And you've got tactics in that <laughs> as well. Well, look, you're the seller and I'm the buyer. You wouldn't expect me to say this is a lovely sample of corn, Tony. I'm obviously, I've got to find all the fort I can. You, on the other hand, are going to count to say, well, look, I've got Bill Jones up the road, I, you see, and uh, you just play one against the other. Yes. That's all part of the uh, uh, dealing. And of course, and, we should show it to a lot of people. And all the farmers I've experienced, they've got a pretty good idea of what the value of the stuff is. And uh, it isn't quite a question of when Jew meets Greek, but it's blooming nearly that. It, it's a, a game that you play, and you both know that you're playing it. Yes. But you, uh, I talk your stuff down, mm. you talk it up. Yes. And your skills had gone on for hundreds of years, passed down from one man to another, yes. and checked against experience. The next generation will have forgotten those skills because they have no use for them. It's, it's like yes. uh, patching ricks yes. or building corn ricks. Yes. See? the modern techniques have overcome.
This is Haygate Flour Mill in Tring, a very modern outfit. Sixty years ago, there were at least 20 mills operating in the area. They've all disappeared except this one. It was there then, small like the others, and it's modernized and survived as part of a larger firm in Northampton. The girls here are doing the same tests as Ralph Seymour did, not by experience like him, but with instruments. This is the moisture test, and nobody's chewing anything. The flour from the mill is no longer delivered just locally. It now goes to bakers over a wide area. It's malting barley. You've been well, eating with malting barley as well. Uh, yes, that was a quite different technique. I remember uh, going, when I'd be about 18 or 19, to an old brewery at Ivinghoe, Robertson Wilson Brewery, and see uh, Reggie Wilson, to uh, try and sell some barley mm -hmm. for malting. Well, now, as you know, if you turn barley to the sun, mm -hmm. It looks so much better. And if you wanted them, we used bags. And yes. if you put it in a black bag, of course, that also made it look much nicer color. So lighter, yeah. I went to this Reggie Wilson and, of course, turned my sample out yeah. on my hand and yeah. sand, you see, and in the sunlight. Yes. And he quietly took me by the shoulder and turned. He said, uh, You've been taught very well, young man. Who taught you that? I said, well, <laughs> I have two uncles who are farmers. And yes. Uncle John said, if you want to sell grain, Ralph, know what you're going to do. Put it in the black bag, boy. It looks better. <laughs> in my life, there's been an advance which would have been unimaginable when I started farming. But some things don't change at all. The day still starts with the dew on the grass, and the harvest can't begin until it's dry. You still have good seasons and bad. It's the scale that's changed. When I first started thinking about farming in 1918, 1920, 1800 weight to the acre was a good yield of wheat in this area. Just before the Second World War, we'd got it up in our best crops to about 3500 weight to the acre, nearly doubled. Now we're disappointed if we don't get 1700 weight to the acre. So the yield of wheat has quadrupled in one man's life. My farm is more than four times as big as it used to be. And where a man could handle about 100 acres, today with modern tractors he can handle 400. For 40 years we've had a developing boom and we've been so successful that we've created a crisis for ourselves. Our machinery lets us work far into the night, producing grain which we may not be able to sell.